Welcome to the Cherry Becker Tax Beat, a conversation about tax that matters. Welcome to this edition of the Cherry Becker Tax Beat. Today is June 8th, 2021, and our main topic of discussion will be the recently released Green Book and the implications on domestic income tax rates, uh, both for individuals and corporations. Uh, This is the first in a two-part series on the Green Book. Um, But first, let's introduce my colleagues that will be joining us on today's podcast. Sarah. Hello, this is Sarah McGregor calling in from Greenville, South Carolina. Barry. This is Barry Wines. I'm sitting in Tampa, Florida today. And Mike. Mike Kirkman, and I am also sitting in Tampa, Florida. Wow. Two, are you uh, going to root for the bolts while you're down there in Tampa? I'm going to cheer on the hurricanes avidly. All right. I was wondering. I'm a closet Montreal fan, I have to confess. But all right. Anyway, my name is Brooks Nelson. I'm a tax partner and I'm sitting in Richmond, Virginia today. So, uh, so Sarah McGregor, how's life treating you? Life is good. It's nice to have the Green Book out. We don't uh, often get these uh, from Treasury. It's a it's, it's a it's a tax term to call that um, information produced by Treasury on proposed revenue raisers and tax uh, law changes that the uh, administration is proposing. So, um, you know, being a tax nerd, it's always good to have have new things to talk about. All right. So let's uh, let me set the table here on the Green Book. So on March 31, uh, the White House released the American Jobs Plan or at least a fact sheet on the American Jobs Plan. On April 28th, about a month later, uh, the White House released a fact sheet on the American Families Plan. Uh, So on May 28th, President Biden proposed a federal budget, and this budget encompasses many of the concepts that were introduced in these two previously released plans. In conjunction um, with this budget, the Treasury released what it calls general explanations of the administration's fiscal year 2022 revenue proposals, AKA the Green Book. It's uh, over 100 pages in PDF. Um, I would say it's a a return to being a well-written document. I thought the American Jobs Plan was well-written. The American Families Plan was a little confusing. I think uh, we've gotten some more clarity on a lot of the concepts. So uh, I'd like to uh, give kudos to the authors on this document. Uh, In the Green Book, we are looking at uh, revenue raisers that are scored in this, at least in the schedules here, at $2.4 trillion. Um, There's a little differential in some of the talks going around about exactly how much, but by by the schedule in the back of this, net $2.4 trillion net revenue raisers. So uh, today, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about primarily the rates corporation rates, individual rates, some of the state and gift tax implications of those rates, uh, some of the other related tax rates, a little bit of maybe some individual credits. Uh, What we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about today is the legislative process. We'll save that for our part two podcast. Um, We're not going to spend a lot of time talking in depth about the ITAX, international tax proposals, the energy and other tax credits and provisions, and the uh, investment in the IRS and uh, increased reporting by the IRS or to the IRS. And we're also not going to be discussing any of the infrastructure spending proposals. So very narrow to these uh, tax domains for this one. So let's uh, let's move forward um, and start with the corporate tax rates because that's the first up in the actual Green Book. So uh, Barry, why don't you uh, talk to us about what we now know from the corporate tax rate proposals and implications? Right. So in in the the prior um, announcements that they had, they announced that they were going to raise the corporate tax rates to 28 percent. They've done that. All, we have a little bit more detail. The effective date right now that they're looking at is January 1 of 2021. So really the rate increase wasn't a big surprise based on what we we're told. The effective date's kind of where we would have expected that to come out on the corporate side. Uh, 20, 
2022, correct. I keep forgetting we're in 2021 already. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So for the corporate rate, that's that's the effective date. Same thing for the individual rates. They increase those to the top rate of 39.6. Uh, once you get above $509,000 for married filing joint, uh, $450,000 for unmarried and, and various other thresholds there. So those are all effective starting next tax year. The rate change that, uh, well, the other corporate rate change was the minimum tax rate. So there's a proposal here that the 15% minimum tax applies not on taxable income or something along those lines, but they're talking about financial statement book income. So if you report financial statements out to the public, they're pr proposing a minimum 15% tax on that. A lot of details to be worked out, but at the same token, the proposal at least only applies to companies with over $2 billion in, in book income. So really about 120, 150 corporations are really gonna have that apply to them worldwide, large companies. So that's where the proposal is right now on the corporate rate. So assuming that proposal uh, went through on the, you know, the 28 percent flat corporate rate, the 15 percent minimum, and what we know about the individual rates. I mean, uh, can you uh, kind of refresh our memories on what you previously said about implications to entity structures and corporate planning? Yes. So right now in the environment we are we're in, money inside of a C corp that's not distributed is taxed less than an individual. So that will continue to, to apply, although the rate differential will be a lot less. So again, the entity selection, what am I going to do with, with operating cash flow? Am I going to distribute? Am I going to turn it back into the company? Things along those lines are still going to mean the entity selection decisions are, you know, you need to go through those exercises to determine that. Um, the big key here is going to be um, the capital gains rate, and we'll talk about that in a minute, because that's going to apply to capital gains and to the dividend. So all of that is going to factor into what is a more favorable um, uh, entity selection. 199 cap A, which is the 20% exclusion for pass-through entities, hasn't been touched in here. Um, there are some provisions to um, deal with the net investment income tax, which is 3.8%, and self-employment tax for some type of taxpayers. Uh, those are all things that need to you know, be worked out and considered. But having said all of that, and not to you know, box you into a corner here, but uh, if you had to just make a general statement, it seems like pass-through entities uh, for people that have the option to be taxed as a pass-through entity are generally going to come out ahead of the uh, corporate structure if we're at 28, certainly if we're at 28 uh, percent. Correct. That a yes. fair I, I think that is that's safe. In most cases, the, 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 the long-term benefit, even with an increased capital gains rate, is still going to be the uh, pass through entities. The only thing that will make a difference in there is if you have a C Corp that qualifies for the as a qualified small business section 1202, that exclusion, which is not being touched in these proposals, that may make a difference. But those those criteria need to be looked at and, and planned for if you're going to go that route. Right. And there's always the caveat there. There are just some situations where you have to be a C corp, and, and there's no way around that. So, right. uh, so, so for, yeah, you're right. So you have business decisions and you have tax decisions. So clearly, the tax decisions may lead one way or the other, but business decisions may cause you to have to go the other route. All right. And so then, the last curveball in this discussion, uh, President Biden has signaled willingness to compromise uh, on the 28% flat rate and uh, substitute 
the 15% minimal tax, it seems to be that minimum tax on all all corporations and not just the super uh, the super duper uh, corporations. So does that change any of your thinking on what you have said? No, not really, because it, it's going to be sort of a, based on book income I, from what we can tell, which means the financial statements decisions are going to now come into play, which is going to be rather interesting. Um, it appears that the G7 has agreed that that the 15 percent proposal is a good idea. So I can certainly see that two billion threshold coming down significantly to to do that, to get whatever deal that they're working on um, to going with that. I, I would also submit that it's very likely if we don't see the 28 percent or an increase in this in the corporate tax rate in this uh, in, in this proposal, uh, it's very likely to come back sometime before the end of the year in another proposal. I, I'm not I, sure. I, I don't think this one's gone. I, I think you could say that about all of these provisions. If if they're talking about a smaller infrastructure pack, uh, package, which is what these uh, revenue raisers are meant to offset, if you have a lower cost, not all of them get in. I can't. I certainly see that they will come back potentially, if not later this year, then the next year. Is these are these are are the targets. Right. And then that leads us into the last one. I assume we want to talk about the capital gains rate. Uh, yeah. So uh, we'll we'll switch to you, Mike. So we got individual rates and we got um, capital gain rates, and we got some. Uh, we'll move into some very what I think complicated provisions on uh, tax and capital gains. But let's just start at the higher level, high net worth individuals with the uh, increased uh, individual rates and uh, qualified dividend capital gain rates. What are some of your thoughts on that? Well, they, they determine that folks who are deemed to be high income earners, they're basically going to go from a top rate of 37% to 39.6%. So it's basically the 2017 index threshold amounts, which for a married filing joint, you're at 509,300 and a single person 452,700. So you, you can see dollars over that are gonna be taxed at the 39.6%. Uh, if, if your income exceeds that threshold, it, depending on the type of income, you could add another 3.8% to that, effectively making your tax rate uh, 43.4%. And th those rates uh, would become effective as of tax years beginning after 1231-21 for high income earners. And, right. and Mike, it looks like um, by going back to those pre-2017 or the 2017 rates, uh, the marriage penalty comes back into play here because the the unmarried tax threshold at four roughly four hundred fifty thousand, and the married taxpayers paying in at a little over five hundred thousand. That's certainly putting more more pressure, more income taxable at those rates uh, for for married couples. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. All right. So, what about the capital gain qualified dividend, Mike? In particular, uh, let's talk about the uh, the shocking. Uh, what I I think the shocking. Uh, part of this uh, proposal is the effective date, so. Exactly, and this is where it gets interesting. Uh, for a married filing joint couple with AGI that exceeds a million dollars, uh, your long-term capital gains and qualified dividends would be taxed at 37%. And then you add the net investment income uh, tax to that, you're really looking at 40.8%. So. Uh, a quick example, just to give some clarity to this, if you had wage income of $900,000 and you had 200,000 of long-term capital gains and qualified dividends, basically $100,000 would be taxed at 40.9%. And, and then when the, the tax rates go up in January of 22, those gains are gonna be taxed at the 39.6, right? That's right, effectively, potentially, or at 43.4%. And, and as Brooks uh, mentioned, you know, this this and that NACMIC date is basically uh, after the date of announcements, which would have been April the 28th of this year. Right. Which I don't know if it's going to get a lot of traction in Congress, but that's not for me to decide. Right, right, right. 
So, uh, Mike, in our previous podcast, we talked about planning uh, based around a perceived increase in capital gain rates. You want to kind of uh, give the high level thoughts on that? I have a number of, of those, but if the after date of announcement uh, gets put into place, then I don't know that there's a lot we can do at this right. point. Sure. Uh, at the beginning of the year, there was a lot of activity and there continues to be uh, in hopes that that doesn't become uh, the, the, the impact of, uh, particularly with regard to long-term capital gains. So there, there's still a lot of activity around uh, selling companies, that may uh, uh, it, it, to get those sales executed in 2021, um, but there's just really no telling based on when this after date of enactment or announcement is going to be uh, uh, considered part of the legislation. But still, if we're talking about uh, trying to maybe accelerate a transaction to potentially benefit from a capital gain, um, still seems like there's not a ton of downside to trying to get it in, hoping that the ultimate effective date is later in the year. Uh, surely there's going to be some pushback about this date. Um, and really the downside is, you know, if you truly accelerate into this year as opposed to next year, but uh, I think you can uh, maybe have a little wiggle room to see how that all plays out. But anyway. And potentially installment sales could, depending on the size of the deal, um, and the appetite for someone to to go through an installment sale could could also benefit a taxpayer. Yeah. In any case, I think it's very unfortunate that they didn't use language effective date of enactment uh, instead of effective date of announcement. So uh, yeah. unnecessary confusion. Um, right. There, there's still a there's still a 2.6 percent tax rate in play between a 37 in 2021 and a potential rise to 39.6 in 2022. So uh, it still pays a little bit if they do go with this uh, date of announcement that there is still a little bit of opportunity to save some taxes before uh, the uh, top bracket, top tax rate changes in January, again, if that's also approved. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's assuming a million dollars uh, in total income. To and, and if you have an installment sale, a planning technique may be to elect out a planning uh, installment sale if you can work the cash flow, sort of have your cake and eat it too, you know, wait and see what happens. And then you would you could trigger it all in the current year, 2021, at potentially a lower rate. So there's some opportunities there. Right. Well, yeah, good idea. Good idea. All right, so Mike, so we've talked about the big picture of this capital gain rate, uh, which also applies to qualified dividends. Let's just go ahead and make sure we say that. Um, but let's talk about, you know, again, the really, uh, I, I don't want to say this was the stunner, but this was the, you know, uh, adding clarity to what we didn't think was uh, apparent in the first proposal, the American Families Plan, about the estate and gift tax implications of this capital gain rate. So at least we now, I think, have a good understanding of what they were trying to say. Um, since we're not always as smart as you are, Mike, in this area, why don't you try to recap what they are, what they are trying to say about capital gains in the estate and gift tax scenario? Okay, well, I appreciate uh, the kudos there on being bright in this area. I had never predicted that I would be reading from the Green Book what I have read, uh, but let me just qualify this by saying that this is part of the income tax section. This has, while it, well, we're dealing with transfers and date of death transfers, it's not an, a transfer tax per se. So uh, let me just start with the gift. So basically, as, as simple as it is, that if an individual transfers appreciated assets, they will have a realized capital gain at the time of the transfer. Now, asterisk that and say, we'll, I'll describe a little later some of the exceptions and exclusions, but generally it's that basic. I do a transfer, it's got appreciation to it, capital gain would be recognized immediately. From an estate standpoint, individual 
uh, deceased owner of appreciated assets will realize capital gains as of the date of death. It's a deemed recognition event. So again, there's capital gains, no, no different than what you would have on if you sold securities. But in this case, you haven't sold anything. You've just moved it from to an heir or to a donee. Right. And there, I think, there's, I'm sorry, I, what's upsetting to me about that proposal is it's a it's a non cash transaction, uh, which, you know, if you're moving valuable property, that's going to uh, frequently force a second transaction to fund the taxes. Uh, it doesn't seem uh, it's not in keeping with normal concepts in taxation. Yeah, and I, I have a, a feeling based on some of the commentary that I have read is that uh, because there's uh, there's some carve outs that don't apply that that apply to family owned businesses and farms that do get uh, some special treatment, but they're really focusing on assets that possibly are a lot more liquid. So the cash is going to be there like marketable securities. You, they're, you're going to be forced to sell a chunk to pay this tax potentially. Uh, but there, there, there are some exclusions which uh, just just to go ahead and go through those. Right. Uh, tra transfers to spouses and to charities. I mean, it's very logical. Um, a tangible personal property, ex except for uh, collectibles, would not be subject. So uh, if you have tangible personal property that's got a, um, a lot of appreciation, which we could have a huge discussion about what's considered tangible personal property and collectibles, uh, those would be excluded. As Barry mentioned, the, the Section 1202 stock is excluded. Uh, from this recognition event, and they're interesting enough. Uh, they're providing a one million dollar exclusion per person, so you'd have a two million dollar transfer during life between a married couple, or a two million dollar date of death between a million and a piece. Uh, that would be excluded from again, not a state taxation, the capital gains portion. Uh, and you also have a similar $250,000 per person for your personal residence. So those those are the exclusions. Uh, they are allowing a portability to remain in this particular area, but I'm not sure how that's going to be applied. And Mike, if I read correctly, the the exclusion on personal residence will doesn't have to be your primary residence. It could be any residence you own at at, at that stage to apply to, which is which is helpful. Yes. That's correct. And what about the installment plan, Mike? Yeah, basically, if if an individual has a family owned or operated business and they transfer that during life, basically that's not going to trigger a gain event. Until the business ceases to be a family owned or operated business or they sell the business. So that's logical. So you have a a patriarch of the family that gives the business to um, a son or a daughter. Uh, there may be gift tax related, but the capital gain trigger on appreciation would not occur at that point. However, if that patriarch of the family dies with that appreciated business, uh, the Green Book is telling us that we'd have a 15 year payment plan at a fixed rate of interest uh, that would be associated with that appreciation. All right, so obviously, you know, this is far from a done deal, but some of this is very unsettling. It's, uh, it, again, it's introducing concepts unlike anything we've ever seen, in my opinion, uh, be going after, un you know, unrecognized uh, transactions here. Um, so well, what's your general takeaway on what we should, you know, what should people be considering uh, in, in the, I know it's not a, a gift tax provision per se, but what, are, I mean, there's still things I think you need to think about from a gifting perspective. I, I think without a doubt, and let me just mention when the proposed effective date uh, for this, the, the capital gains related to the uh, estate and gift uh, transfers would be tr for transfers after December 31 of 2021. Right. Uh, and let me just what should people be thinking about? No, no question what they're already thinking about. And I think the, the fact that we've got a transfer uh, and, and 
effective date of 1231-2021 gives people the time to do what they're already doing. They're making transfers, uh, they're doing planning. Uh, there's a lot of valuations that are going on. Uh, so that, that's not gonna change from the last conversation that we all had. That that type of planning is already gonna happen. And I think it, it the capital gains proposal here added to the estate and gift tax only I think exacerbates the need to for people that have high appreciating assets to do planning. Uh, Mike, any concern that you know this one million dollar capital gain exclusion translates into a an agenda to move the estate and gift exemption down to that kind of level? Um, well, it it clearly could. I think the the three point one has been suggested by. Uh, the administration, uh, but it's interesting that if you look at this type of additional tax that they're, they're calling a, an income tax on this appreciation, uh, you could have an individual that ha incurs this tax at death and then also on top of that incurs a, a state tax transfer uh, tax on top of the capital gains tax. Now, uh, the Green Book does, uh, emphasize the fact that you would get an deduction a deduction on the estate tax return for the tax paid that's related to the capital gains pickup tax on the appreciation um, but but it's a hefty uh, scenario there and there's a lot that you could say when you're being taxed at these kind of rates uh, but it would be really uh, a huge revenue generator in my opinion if they reduce the estate tax exclusion and the gift tax exclusion uh, at to as low as a million dollars okay. well it's clearly not a promising signal i think for those who want to see a, the exemption stay unchanged all right so, so there's another little sleeper for provision in here about um realizing uh, capital gains in non-corporate entities. Uh, Sarah, you want to talk a little bit about that one? I thought that was also very disturbing. Right. right. So it, it appears to be that they're what they're after uh, are some long-term, some dynasty-type trusts that are holding uh, family wealth, uh, maybe a family-owned company, maybe long-held uh, stock or other assets. And uh, if you hold it long enough, say 90 years, and you haven't done anything uh, to that trust hasn't triggered uh, a recognition event uh, uh, that would cause that to be taxable, then lo and behold, at, at the end of 90 years, you're going to have to pay some tax on whatever that built-in gain is in there. Um, the the interesting is the start date is is going to be about 1940. So the first time this would come into play will be at the end of the year of, of 2030. So that gives uh, everyone about eight or nine years to plan for this and and cause some triggering events or or bulk up on some losses to help offset it. But I I thought that was it's clearly aimed at uh, at at someone or at some trusts uh, or other entities to to try to generate some some revenues here. Right. Well. I okay. believe that they're they're targeting uh, the grantor trust without getting the technical details of it, but people from a planning standpoint for years have made irrevocable transfers to trust for the benefit of future generations and caused the trust to be taxed to the donor. So the you're effectively got the tax being paid and it's not considered a gift to the trust. So the trust never incurs the burden of the income tax. So if you create, uh, as Sarah said, a dynasty trust that it's it's going on forever and ever, uh, effectively at some point when it does end or a in-kind asset is distributed out that has appreciation, uh, that's when the triggering of that gain will be occur will occur, and it's, as Brooks mentioned earlier, it's a non it's a recognized event, but you haven't realized any cash. All right, let's have one more topic discussion, and then we'll get into a little bit of a lightning round on some four or five. But let's talk about the uh, net investment income tax and the uh, self employment tax stuff, uh, Sarah. Uh, you know. What are they trying to say? What are they actually 
trying to uh, avoid or trying to uh, penalize here? Right. So they're trying to uh, bring all pastor entities, uh, partnerships, LLCs, general partnerships, limited partnerships, uh, limited liability companies, and uh, S corporations under the same roof when it comes to who's paying how much uh, tax on earnings. And in this case, we're talking about <clears throat> not an income tax, but the self-employment tax and the funds that flow into the hosp hospital trust fund through the additional Medicare tax and the net investment income tax. So you have, uh, in essence, uh, FICA, Medicare, net investment income tax, and the additional Medicare tax, uh, which all play together and sort of are in, intended to help fund the uh, old age and survivors and disability, as well as Medicare and the hospital trust funds. So the idea here is, you know what? A general partnership gets taxed on that income as uh, self-employment. They they are, if you're actively, whether you're actively engaged in the business or not, limited partners are not taxed on self-employment income. But if you're actively involved, then you can avoid the net investment income tax. For an S corporation, whether you're actively engaged or not, <clears throat> your income is not going to be subject to self, the, the distribution income from that S corporation is generally not subject to the self-employment tax and if you're actively involved, it's not going to be subject to net investment income tax. So the idea here is just to uh, level the playing field so that all of that income is going to be subject, no matter what type of pass-through entity you have, if you're actively involved in the business, it's going to be subject to the self-employment taxes. And then depending on what, how active you are in the business, it may or may not be subject to the net investment income tax. Um, in in that regard. So that's what they're aiming for. And, and if they accomplish that, it's going to have a big impact on entity selection. Because right now, the only real advantage for an S Corp is the avoidance of some of these taxes. But in, in turn for that, you have certain restrictions on limitations of, of shareholders and how you have to do allocations. If I'm going to be taxed the same, why do I want to be an S Corp? Why do I want to try to avoid that and then wind up with these other limitations? So I could certainly see a move away from S corps if all of these provisions are equalized, because then from an income tax perspective, it doesn't really matter. And the restri other restrictions that come into play with S corps are, are not going to be something I want to put up with. And, and those that are in the highest tax bracket are going to be facing um, the ordinary income tax rates, <clears throat> they're going to become indifferent as to whether or not it comes through as compensation or whether it comes through as a distribution type income. So again, it's going to uh, sort of simplify some of the the concerns we have now <clears throat> about whether um, owners are fairly compensated for the work that they do for the organization, um, in particularly for an S corporation. Right. I I agree, and I, I the lack of clarity on how you uh, treat LLC members and LLP members for self-employment tax. It's you know certainly been a confusion in the system. Um, and anyway, sometimes a step towards simplicity is a good thing, and maybe we would get there. I still think writing laws and the regulations to accomplish this are going to be way more challenging uh, than it's going to appear on the surface. All right, so let's um, hit a few items quickly. Uh, Sarah, offshore expense disallowance. Right, so uh, this was included in to, dis, uh, to disallow deductions for companies that are offshoring business. They're, they're taking a line of work or business or employment or activity here in, that is ongoing here in the U.S., and they're moving it to operations uh, to a plant or a location uh, outside of the United States, and uh, the IRS or the, the the code would then disallow a deduction for the expenses of moving that line of production or that line of activity to an offshore location. On the on the flip side, they're offering a 10% credit uh, or a, a tax credit for up to 10% of the expenses 
for onshoring, for bringing a production line or an activity that is currently offshore into the U.S. Uh, and making it uh, uh, domesticating that that activity. Uh, one of the things I thought particularly noteworthy is this is one of the items that the disallowance of offshore and expenses as a as an effective date of date of enactment, as opposed to the vast majority of this is for next calendar year. So if you want to offshore, do it now while well, you can still get the deduction. If you want to onshore, wait so that exactly. you can earn the credit. There you go. Words of wisdom. Um, carried interest, Sarah. Uh, the proposal is to completely eliminate the Section 1061 <clears throat> uh, out of the code. And that would mean that all of those who are receiving uh, partnership interests and, and other similar type um, for the services they provide will be taxed on any income they receive, no matter its character, as ordinary income. Um, the 1031 exchanges. Yes, this would eliminate uh, entirely 1031 exchanges for uh, higher income individuals. It would still allow gains to be deferred up to $500,000, but uh, any more than that, any gain real above that amount would have to be realized and recognized to pay tax on. So it's it's a further restriction of res restraining of that um, uh, tax deduction. And, and I could... If this does get enact, enacted, I could see a rush uh, to try to uh, consummate 1031 exchanges by uh, year end or, or and also to rebalance people that are into the rollover of, of 1031 type investments to mm -hmm. uh, you know, try to do a major reallocation, a, a one time freebie, so to speak. Uh, Barry, excess business losses again. Yeah, so the, the 2017 Act introduced this concept of excess business losses. So if I've got a bunch of losses from companies, uh, I'm going to be limited up to a half a million dollars against current income. And then it's going to be carried forward as, as NOLs, which have a separate restriction. Right now, that is slated to lapse or go away in 2026. And this provision is just going to keep that as a permanent. So it's not going to allow people to generate a bunch of losses in a given year and, and try to offset a bunch of other income. So um, although with all the different rate provisions, uh, that will be rather interesting. So I could wind up uh, with a lot of capital gains rates taxed at, at high rates and um, not be able to shelter it from these losses. So, Brooks, just a bit as we wind up here, just a bit of bright news that was in the Green Book, and that has to do with the um, the administration's uh, intent to uh, extend some of the tax credits for families and for child care and for child tax credits and for uh, earned income tax credits. Those were expanded uh, under the uh, American Rescue Plan, and so this proposal also wants to uh, continue those in, in uh, expansions and uh, even make some of them permanent and uh, uh, to, to, to help out families and working families. All right. Very good. So let me uh, add some of my wrap up comments here. My takeaway uh, from our discussion today uh, with the capital gain effective date being date of announcement that puts a little uh chill in me as far as wanting to run out and execute a transaction to accelerate you know immediately um it does want me to really uh plan in case i do want to do that capital gain transaction it makes me want to really think hard about do i want to do a corporate restructuring um and get capital gains or dividends out uh, do I want to trigger some of these other transactions, a 1031 that we just talked about? Uh, so transactionally, I want to be thinking a lot about uh, what does this mean to me? And I want to be ready to move if some of this comes to fruition. Um, on the other hand, these capital gain provisions in the estate and gifts uh, context, and again, I know it's not a state and gift tax technically, but it's in that arena. Uh, I, I don't see how you can interpret this in any w other way that if you 
have gifting that needs to be done that you're even remotely considering, I mean, you really need to accelerate uh, accelerate into that plan right now. Um, Sarah, any other wrap up comments on your end? Uh, no, except all of this is um, up for negotiation and uh, we'll have to see what actually gets gets passed in a in a couple of months. Right. And that leads me to the next little reminder that we do have a Green Book Part 2 podcast coming up where we will discuss a little bit more of the legislative process and where we are and the give and take and the negotiations amongst other things as well. All right, a quick disclaimer that we are not providing personal tax advice on this podcast. Please consult with your personal tax advisor, hopefully at Cherry Beckert, uh, with your specific tax issues. Check out our firm's website, cbh.com, for the latest guidance and materials on this and other tax and business topics. Um, as a, a plug, we do ha still have the American Families Plan and the American Jobs Plan podcast out there to discuss several of these related topics more in depth and in different ways. All right, that, that concludes today's podcast on Green Book Part 1, focusing on the uh, rates. Uh, thank you, Sarah, Barry, and Mike. Thank you, our listeners, for spending your time with us. We truly appreciate it. Uh, let's call it a day and go forth in peace.